All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. I want to express our nation's deepest condolences and most heartfelt sympathies to the family of George Floyd. A terrible event. Terrible, terrible thing that happened. I've asked that the Department of Justice expedite the federal investigation into his death and do it immediately, do it as quickly as absolutely possible. Uh, it's a local situation, but we're also making it into a federal situation, and it's, uh, it's a terrible thing. We all saw what we saw, and uh, it's uh, very hard to even conceive of anything other than what we did see. It should never happen, should never be allowed to happen, a thing like that. But we're determined that justice be served. And uh, I spoke to members of the family, terrific people, and we'll be reporting as time goes by. Uh, we think that uh, we also have to make the statement, and it's very important, that uh, we have peaceful protesters and support the rights for peaceful protesters. We can't allow a situation like happened in Minneapolis to descend further into lawless anarchy and chaos. And we understand that very well. It's uh, very important, I believe, to the family, to everybody, that the memory of George Floyd be a perfect memory. Let it be a perfect memory. The looters should not be allowed to drown out the voices of so many peaceful protesters. They hurt so badly what is happening. And it's uh, so bad for the state and for that great city. So we are working very closely with the Justice Department. We're working with local law enforcement. We're working with everybody. And we're speaking with the family. And hopefully, everything can be uh, fairly taken care of. I understand the hurt. I understand the pain. People have uh, really been through a lot. The family of George is entitled to justice, and the people of Minnesota are entitled to live in safety. Law and order will prevail. The Americans will honor the memory of George and uh, the Floyd family. It's very important to us. It's very important to me to see that Everything is taken care of properly. It's a horrible, horrible situation. And uh, so we'll be reporting back in due course and as quickly as possible. I'm pleased to welcome American industry leaders to the White House as we continue to safely reopen America. We're glad to be joined by Jeff Pilati of Wyndham Hotel. And resorts, uh, Wyndham Hotels have been a uh, really terrific company over the years. Brian Goldner of Hasbro, Dave Hoffman of Duncan Brands, Gary Kelly of Southwest Airlines. Really good jobs they've done. Rodney McMullen of Kroger. Thanks, Rodney. Oscar Munoz of United. Thank you, Oscar. United Airlines. Brad Smith of Microsoft. That stock has done very well, I will say. Great job. Great job. Sonia Sengal of Gap. And uh, thank you very much. Also with us are Secretary of Treasury Steve Mnuchin and Secretary of Labor Gene Scalia. Our nation continues to mourn for the lives claimed by the virus and grieve for the families who have lost loved ones. We continue to battle the invisible enemy. We're directing the full resources and support of the federal government to safeguard high-risk populations, especially in nursing homes. We've been a very powerful strategy on nursing homes for quite a while. The best strategy for public health is to aggressively protect the most vulnerable while allowing younger and healthier Americans to work safely. Nationwide hospitalizations New cases and deaths are all declining. We are tracking cases and hospitalizations daily, and states are demonstrating their ability to rapidly identify and contain new outbreaks. Our testing is the best in the world. We've now surpassed 15 million tests, which is much more than any other country, by a factor of many times. We've completed over 15 million, and uh, 
that is, uh, I think we can say that's a record by a lot. And we're going to give you a big report on testing tomorrow. We have new tests coming out that are uh, above and beyond anything that anybody would have thought even possible just a couple of months ago. In many places, we've uh, had more tests available than people seeking them. Uh, Florida and others have uh, said that they have testing and they, uh, they don't have enough people to take the test. So we've come a long way. We started with an empty cupboard we didn't have a lot that we inherited, and uh, we are, I think, really, they've stepped up to the plate on ventilators, on tests, and on equipment and gowns and everything else, gloves. If you look at uh, masks, everybody has masks now. To maintain the health and safety of our society, we must also maintain the health of our economy. There's a reason why our nation's life expectancy is closely correlated with economic development. A never-ending shutdown would increase, not reduce the total loss of life in the United States while failing to focus resources on the most vulnerable. Uh, we've made a lot of progress in terms of the invisible enemy. A lot of progress. A lot of things have happened that have uh, taught us a lot. Nobody has ever seen anything like this, and there certainly hasn't been anything like this since over 100 years, 1917. I want to thank all of these great companies for being here and representing their company and themselves and our country so well. We're going to be having a discussion with the companies as to suggestions they have. We think we're going to have a very strong opening, which has just started, really. We had the greatest economy in history of any country, not just ours. The greatest in history. We had the best employment numbers that we've ever had. We've had the best uh, numbers in every way, whether it's uh, the biggest tax cuts, the greatest regulation cuts of any president. Nobody's even come close. We've rebuilt our military. We have the strongest military we've ever had. New equipment coming in all the time. A lot of it already arrived. And uh, very importantly, all made in the USA. And uh, so many other things. You look at what we've done for the vets with choice and accountability, the combination they weren't able to get that done for over 40 years, and we got them both approved. Uh, right to try, got it approved. We've done so much, and then we had to turn it all off in order to be in a position where we are right now. Numbers were estimated to be 2 million deaths, 1.5 million deaths, maybe 1 million, but it could have been over 2 million and maybe substantially over. Unfortunately, one is too many. It should have been stopped. It could have been stopped in China. It should have been stopped in China. But it didn't stop. And the world got infected. And it's very sad, very sad thing. But we turned off the greatest economy ever. And we turned it off very quickly, very rapidly. We banned people coming in from China early, very early. In fact, most people said, don't do it. Even a month later, they were saying, you shouldn't have done it. And we turned out to be right. But we have, uh, we have now a long way to go. But we're getting very good early numbers, as everyone knows. The stock market has been doing very well because people have a lot of confidence. We're doing very well on therapeutics. We're doing very well on vaccines. I think we're going to have some very good answers soon. And we're set up logistically with our military. Our military is set to move and to act so that when — I think I can say when we have that vaccine, I think I can say it with pretty good surety, based on what we're seeing, that rather than taking long periods of time and bringing it out slowly, we're able to bring it out very, very quickly. So we have a general in charge of logistics. That's what he does. And he's supposed to be the best, usually moving soldiers and moving various things for other reasons. But now he's going to be moving vaccines or therapeutics, depending on what ultimately ends up. But we're doing very well on vaccines. We're doing very, very well on therapeutics. And maybe I could use the word cure as opposed to purely therapeutic. So I want to thank everybody for being here. Uh, we have a lot of positive things to report. You see uh, some of the numbers coming out with some of the states that have been uh, — have been opened. And uh, some of the numbers have been really, really uh, beyond expectation. So we're very happy. And I think what we'll do is we'll go around the room quickly. And we'll say a few things about uh, any ideas you might have, your company, how well you've done with your companies. 
and uh, might as well give it a little buildup. You have plenty of firepower back here. So please, maybe you'd start. Thank you. Oh, great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm honored to be here today as representing Gap Inc. and working with all of you to safely open our stores, which is very important for us right now. I uh, have the honor of running America's largest clothing company. Gap Inc. had over $16 billion in revenue last year, and we house $4 billion brands between Old Navy, Athleta, Banana Republic, and our namesake, Gap. And uh, Old Navy is uh, the second largest apparel brand in the U.S. Wow, so, great. you know, we have uh, serviced American families for our 51 years, and we, these brands represent the best of American values, and we're anxious to get going and anxious to open up the economy. We have 2,500 stores here in the U.S., and we've begun the opening process. Uh, you know, prior to COVID, we had over a million American customers walking through our doors every day. Wow. And so when we shut in March, uh, we lost 70 percent of our sales overnight, and we uh, reacted very quickly. We had to make really big, unfortunate decisions to furlough employees and to retrench. Uh, we did have a very strong and powerful e-commerce business, so we're the second largest e-com player for apparel, and that's really kept us going along with our fulfillment centers. Uh, we have five big campuses across the U.S., and so that's been great. Uh, we have, you know, over 100,000 employees that we're anxious to really bring back to work. We, uh, you know, we've, be we've developed these safe shopping protocols with industry leaders in retail, and. Uh, we feel really good about them. We're anxious to reopen our stores with these protocols and have been excited about what's happening so far as we've opened. Our employees feel safe, our customers feel safe, uh, and uh, they're coming back to shop with us. And so we are committed to opening at least 800 stores this month. Right. And so we're, we're on track for that. In fact, we're a little ahead of that, which feels good. And as customers come in, you know, they'll have new protocols, social distancing, masks, and, and cleaning, right. et cetera. Um, so it's going to, you know, create trust, and uh, everyone's responding really well. Um, I visited our stores in Virginia last night, and I visited our stores in Texas and Arizona, California over the last couple of weeks, and uh, our customers are thrilled to be back. Our employees are thrilled to be back. In fact, one of our, uh, our store managers came up to me and burst into tears thanking, thanking me for giving her her job right. back. You know, it's a really very important thing, and as much as the gov government's helped, our employees want to be back. So. That feels great. Uh, one in four Americans work in retail, as you know, so this is now my time to ask what we need. And, and during this closure process, half of retail stayed open and half of retail's been shut. So we've really created this um, lack of level playing field, you know, the haves and the have-nots. And you know, as we look forward and as we think about uh, a possibility of a resurgence or something, we, we must stay committed to these safe retailing protocols and really stay there um, and, and work through any future issues with that so we can have an equal playing field. So I look forward to working thank with you. you and Secretary Mnuchin has been fantastic That's to work great. with. He's so done a great you. job. Thank you, Sonia. Appreciate it. Steve? Thank you, Mr. President. I really want to thank everybody. And Sonia, thank you for all the work you've done and everyone else. I, I do want to just particularly thank Gary and Oscar. Uh, as part of the GARES Act, we've worked with both of you and the rest of the airline industry. I know. Many of the businesses here have been hit very hard, but the travel industry in particular, and we appreciate everything you've done with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oscar, please. That's a heck of a lead. Uh, thank you as well. Thank you. The CARES Act was great, and everybody that was involved. Larry, you were terrific as well in the waning moments. Uh, you know our story, so I, don't, I won't belabor it. Um, I have two slides, really one, uh, just to give you a sense of the things that we're doing. One of the most Conversed, com conversed uh, discussions going, um, are airplanes safe? Is flying safe? Uh, and I think that's of paramount importance. We've always been one of the, if not the safest industry in the world. And so some of the things that we're doing are on this chart. Uh, and it's simply everything you think, hydrostatic testing that disinfects, wiping everything down, the wearing of masks for everyone. We were one of the first to, to be able to do that. Um, you know, t touchless aspects. Uh, our customers get a chance to sh uh, sit, choose where they sit. Uh, the HEPA filters on our aircraft. I think it's important for the flying public to understand. These HEPA filters are hospital-grade filters that remove 99.7 percent of particles in the air. The combination of the filter and the mask that we're wearing should completely eliminate, to a great degree, the aspect that if we practice all the other things. Uh, and so we're working through all of that. 
Uh, but again, it, it feels like we're always talking into the wind with regards to that. So we took it a step further and have partnered with different people, Clorox in particular. Right? It's a brand name that speaks of powerful disinfectant. And it, it, that branding aspect gives it a little bit of sense. And then we went a step further and used Mayo Clinic, or Cleveland Clinic, apologize, uh, to guide us and direct us. Here are the things that we're planning on doing. Is that meaningful? It's like having Ambassador Burks at our side to sort of support those things. So those are the things that we're doing with regards to our uh, uh, safety. On the next chart, your question is, how do, we, how do we restart the economy? If I can get the next chart, please. Uh, the first one's obvious, and I think we've all been talking at it in the business community. It isn't just about airlines flying. People have to go someplace and fly somewhere, right? Uh, the, the hotels of the world, the, you know, the, the hospitals, I mean, the, the, the restaurants, the uh, theme parks, all of that has to be collectively. And I think everything we do as a business and as a government is to ensure that we take everybody into an account, into account, and not forget um, uh, the fact that uh, airlines are only part of it. And, and so that's an important part. And, and then again, uh, from a health perspective. I don't know that there's another nation that has more powerful pull back to branding than the U.S. Anything that comes out of the U.S. is going to be accepted. So thank you for the efforts. Ambassador was wonderful at those conversations. And then lastly, and this is the big ask from our perspective, uh, you know, we are global. We fly over 60 countries. And this isn't a China question. This is the general aspect of when the world restarts to fly. Uh, it's historically every government, every country will have its own regulatory scheme to start flying. That is called patchwork. That is not harmonization. In order to get the economy going and flowing uh, from a perspective of the entire planet, it's important that we work with your teams to get right. that harmonization and avoid patchwork. So Good. thank you again for everything. Thank you, Oscar. I appreciate it. You've been very much a factor in what we've done. You've been really helpful. We appreciate it. Larry Kudlow, please. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank to everybody who's come here and worked with us, and um, I hope everything continues the pace. You know, I, we try to follow, Kevin Hassett and I try to follow these high frequency economic indicators, and my little list is growing. I'll just rattle it off because things, as things open safely, I say that because Deb is here, uh, truckloads, freight shipping, air travel, hotel bookings, TSA travelers, all starting to shoot up. They're really uh, green shoots. You mentioned the stock market, sir, which has done very well. Apple mobility, gasoline demand, tremendous housing demand. Uh, applications for mortgages and so forth are actually now pre-pandemic levels again with low interest rates. And um, we had a number today from the income report. The saving rate, sir, is 33 percent for the month of April, 33 percent, which is to say We've given them a lot of income. Government income has boosted things, liquidity, cash, and so forth. Stephen's uh, uh, great efforts on Capitol Hill. And of course, the stores have been closed. They have nowhere to spend. So they're saving at a 33% rate. That's almost 10 times the norm. So that, my final point, as we open and as the stores open, we are going to see a boom in spending I think and so. At the stores. I agree. A I think boom. We're starting to see it. Yes, I think sir. you're going to be very, uh, people are going to be very surprised. We're going to have a great third quarter, a great fourth quarter. I think next year is going to be one of our better years. So that's really great. Thank you very much, Larry. Yes, sir. So Jay Clayton is the head of the SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission, and he's done a fantastic job. And I thought maybe uh, I'd invite him up and you could say a few words if you'd like, Jay. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, what I want to say is I appreciate the information that your companies have given us today. Investors want to understand the operational and financial challenges you're facing. The more they understand them, whether they're good or bad, the more your plans are solid for overcoming them, the more confidence they have, and our markets work better. I'd be remiss if I didn't thank Secretary Mnuchin and our friends at the Fed for the way they have supported our markets through this uncertain time. And I really want to thank the many companies who've been very candid with their disclosure about where they stand. That's what our investors expect. I think you've done a terrific job giving our investors what they expect. And I look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you very much, Jay. Thank you. Southwest Airlines, what a great company. Go ahead. Well, thanks, Mr. President. It's uh, a pleasure to be here on behalf of all the Southwest people. And uh, my name is Gary Kelly. And uh, again, I want to thank you. I want to thank Secretary Mnuchin. The CARES Act was exactly what we needed 
Uh, the speed and the scope were just absolutely breathtaking. Before, the markets were closed, and after that, the markets opened up, uh, and we've been able to do a, a significant amount of financing, so thank you. It was, uh, it was just the right thing for our economy. Um, I'll just mirror, uh, echo uh, what uh, several have already said in terms of the business. Uh, we got down to about 2 percent uh, of the normal traffic volumes and are up well beyond that, thank goodness. We're not there, uh, but I'll take uh, 15 percent as opposed to uh, 2. So we've got a long way to go, but the trends are in the right direction. Um, I think what is important is to make sure that our employees and our customers know that it is safe. And uh, that is our number one priority, to make sure that we have a healthy and safe environment. Uh, again, I'll echo a lot of what uh, Oscar has already covered, uh, but we published the Southwest Promise in early May, and it addresses cleaning of the airport, uh, deep cleaning of the airplane. Uh, we require a mask of our customer-facing employees as well as our customers. Uh, we are not booking the airplanes full so that the middle seats are open uh, to allow for physical distancing. And it's a layered approach. Uh, the one thing that we would like to see, and I know that the administration is looking very carefully at this, is to add a health screening uh, at the TSA checkpoint. I think a temperature check like we had today coming into the White House would be very right. sensible, uh, along with a health declaration. Uh, and we're working closely with the TSA on that point. Uh, I think beyond that, um, I think ongoing tax burden reduction would be very helpful in terms of ticket taxes. I know we've got a ticket tax holiday for 2020. Uh, as sales begin to pick up and airlines begin to get back on their feet, that, that could be something worth looking at. And I think for all of us, uh, some sensible form of liability protection, uh, which I know uh, is also a topic, would make uh, great sense. But we applaud all that uh, the administration is doing. I think the key, indeed, is to get uh, treatments for when people are sick, number one, so that they're confident uh, that they'll quickly get back on their feet, and then number two, uh, ultimately getting a vaccine. When that happens, I think that things will absolutely take off uh, lastly, again, I wanted to thank, thank you all for the support with the payroll support program. We've never had a furlough or a layoff or a pay cut in our history at Southwest, and we sure don't want to have that now. So uh, thank you again, and uh, we're going to fight the good fight here. And thank you, Gary. Great job you do for a long time. Thank you very much. Deborah, please. Um, we've made amazing progress together with the American people and with you all. Um, as you heard the President describe, new hospitalizations are down month over month by 50 percent. Um, mortality, the fatalities that we all grieve are down significantly week over week. Um, we're excitingly really finding governors and mayors being able to respond to the epidemic in a new way. Proactive testing, finding new cases, contact tracing, and stopping outbreaks. We're seeing that over and over again county by county, metro by metro. I think we're working with all of the health care providers, because just as we want to open up America safely, we want to make sure every American has access to health care. We want to see our babies immunized. We want to see them at their well baby checkups. We want to see pregnant women cared for in their appointments. And we want to see the hospitals back caring for people and doing elective surgery and ensuring people are getting their cancer screenings. So as we open up the economy, we also want to ensure the Americans are not only COVID-free, but have all their health care taken care of. So you're seeing much improved numbers. Much improved numbers. And I think this proactive testing, having enough tests available not only for diagnosing at the hospitals and clinic, but having an abundance of testing available to really be able to do what we talk about is proactive surveillance, going into nursing homes and then testing 100 percent of the residents, 100 percent of the workers working in food processing plants to test everyone that is there and really stopping outbreaks before they start. This asymptomatic piece is, uh, is unique among diseases. And we have that in HIV. We have it in this, in this particular respiratory disease. And so you, you have to test proactively to find the asymptomatic. Um, no one intends to infect others. 
They just don't know they're infected themselves. And so working with states and governors and mayors to really set up those testing sites has really been extraordinary. And having a testing available at that level, I think we're about 350, 400,000 tests a day. We're up to having tested 5% of every American in less than That's two fantastic. months. That's fantastic. It's great. I wish the press would report it. But someday they will. Someday they're going to do that. Thank you very much, Deborah. I appreciate it. A lot of progress has been made. Great job you're doing. Thank you. Please. Hi, Mr. President. I'm Brian Goldner with Hasbro. And thank you for your leadership and for working closely with the private sector to reopen the American economy. You may know that Hasbro is a nearly 100-year-old Rhode Island-based play and entertainment company with brands like Monopoly, Transformers, Play-Doh, Peppa Pig, and Nerf. And it's really an honor to be here today. It's also an incredible honor to see how our brands are resonating with consumers, more people getting together and connecting and playing with games and brands like Play-Doh as they spend time together. We were talking um, as we were coming together today just how people are making new connections. And uh, we're very excited about that and then the reopening of the economy. And I also have to thank you for the partnership that we've had over time with Director Kudlow. And uh, it's great to get the uh, support that we've seen from Secretary Mnuchin as well. You know, from health screenings to interactive handbooks, safe return to the office, safe social distancing, staggering shifts in our warehouses and factory floors, we are safely reopening U.S. businesses. If we could go to the next slide. We've worked closely with governors in our region, the Rhode Island Governor Raimondo and the Massachusetts Governor Baker to design safe reopening guidelines. I'm especially proud of our Hasbro safety folks and operations. Uh, we've set a standard in our factories and warehouse operations across the country for consumer goods manufacturers. In fact, we're training other consumer goods manufacturers to help them open safely in the U.S. from Massachusetts to Texas. Um, so uh, again, I'm very pleased to be here. I'm very proud of our employees. They're all very excited about getting back to work. And uh, we've been working all along. And as our factories closed down during certain times over the last few months, um, our teams came together to make face shields in our factories, 50,000 a week to, right. to give uh, to healthcare workers. And uh, we've made good use of those factories. And we're now happy to see them back up and running. And so thank you again, and great thank you job, for leadership. Brian. That's really great. Thank we you. appreciate that, too. Thank, thank you very you. much. Hi, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, great to be here. Thank you to the team, uh, your leadership team as well. And uh, look, I'm here representing our great franchisees for both brands, Duncan and, and Baskin. I don't think a lot of people realize that we're 100 percent franchised. And so big brand names powered by small independent uh, business owners. Yeah. and. We've got, a, we've got a saying uh, in the company that we think we've been uh, getting America running for nearly 70 years. And when this crisis hit, it was about keeping the communities running, but it was also about getting America working again. And so we've been guided by one simple principle if, uh, on the next slide that we've been talking about is uh, it's been about doing the right thing in the communities we serve. And 90% uh, of our restaurants uh, have remained open during the crisis. Uh, we've rallied around that mantra of people over profits and, and doing the right thing there. And look, we're very proud that we uh, didn't have to furlough or do layoffs uh, during all of that. And look, our great franchisees, um, uh, I'm really proud of the work that they've been doing in the communities they serve. They live in these communities. Uh, they're proud to be there. Uh, they serve probably coffee, donuts, ice cream to over 300 hospitals. They continue to do that. They raised $1.5 million for uh, food banks, including the Capital Food Bank here in our backyard here in D.C. as well. And so, um, as um, somebody said, we're starting to see a lot of hope and optimism in our business today. We're seeing really good signs of encouraging green shoots right now. Uh, we're working with the franchisees, again, to get America working again, looking at a, a, a really aggressive uh, hiring campaign over the summer. But I'd say it's three areas that we focused on that was really a good North Star for us. And the first was we got in early on a lot of the safety measures, making investments in safety measures as brand standards across both brands. But for us and brands like Duncan and Baskin, um, our mission is to give the consumer as many ways to access your brand 
on their terms. We know there's a lot of consumers out there that have varying levels of, of comfort uh, in terms of what's going on right now. So whether it's drive through curbside, uh, pick up windows, delivery, you'll hear a lot about digital today as well. Uh, giving the consumer as many options, as many choices to access your brand is important. And I think the last thing, um, I'll repeat what a, a few other people said. Um, uh, thank you to you and your administration and the federal government for the PPP program. That has really allowed us to keep our franchisees standing up, allowed them to continue to serve the communities uh, and keep America working. And, and my ask in all of this would be um, the uh, second round, second version of this that sailed through the House, the flexibility plan on PPP. Uh, I'm just hoping that, you know, it's, uh, it sails through cleanly and gets to your desk to be signed because that's another great example of uh, helping small independent business owners like right. our franchisees keep America working right now. So thank Good. you for your consideration. Thank you, David, very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, President Trump, and I uh, really appreciate the invitation to talk about reopening uh, businesses in America. Uh, my name is Rodney McMullen. I'm the chairman and CEO at Kroger. I represent over 500,000 associates, uh, and we've hired over 100,000 people over the last two months. And, uh, you know, our job is to keep our supply chain operating, uh, fresh, affordable food and essentials. And uh, we uh, operate 2,800 stores, uh, 35 uh, manufacturing plants, 44 distribution facilities. Uh, if you look at our associates, uh, we've invested over $800 million uh, in safety procedures and rewards for our associates uh, over the last uh, uh, eight, nine weeks. Obviously, uh, we all do everything we can to make sure we keep our employees safe and uh, on a daily basis. Uh, if you look at our customers, we have 11 million people a day that come into our stores. Uh, so uh, the things that we're doing to protect our uh, uh, employees, we're also doing the same thing to uh, protect our customers. Uh, we use every available way of trying to remind customers on social distancing, uh, limiting the number of people in the stores. We have an in-store radio network that every 15 minutes we remind people of, you know, social distancing. But everything that we can do, uh, we're trying to remind people to stay safe and do things. Uh, we also are uh, supporting our business and continuing to make sure that we have a viable, strong business over time and supporting the communities that we operate in. Over the last year, working with local food banks, we've been able to provide, over, uh, over the last three years, over a billion meals uh, with local food banks. And it's something that, uh, you know, in the United States, no one should have to go to bed tonight hungry. Uh, we have so many resources as a country, and uh, together we can eliminate food waste, and when we eliminate food waste, we can make sure no one goes to bed hungry. Obviously, is one of the things uh, that we thought it would be helpful to pay forward. Uh, as a company that's operated throughout the pandemic, uh, we've learned a lot. And uh, one of the things you'll learn is uh, be agile and move quickly. And if you think you should do something, you probably should do it. Uh, with that, we developed a 59-page uh, blueprint uh, that we made public, and we've shared it. And uh, I know the other day I was on the Today Show and they asked me like four times, why would you do that? And one of the things that was incredibly helpful for us is uh, other retailers across the world that were in front of us from the pandemic standpoint was nice enough to share their learnings with us. And we thought it was only fair and appropriate for us to share our learnings with others. Um, we've had over 100,000 site visits on that. We've had over 26,000 individuals and companies download that. We get a ton of uh, notes from small companies uh, in terms of their appreciation. You know, if you look at all the companies in this room, uh, we have a lot of resources. Uh, but if you think about somebody with 50 employees or 100 employees or 200 employees, uh, the resources they have uh, is just not the same as us. Uh, so sharing that across. Uh, it's been something that's been uh, important, and it's uh, a real pleasure to represent all the Kroger Associates and being able to help America get uh, started again. So thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Rodney, very much. And thank you for all the help, too. You've been right from the beginning. Appreciate it. Yeah, happy to. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Kevin, please. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, I think that you can sense the optimism around the room that businesses, uh, really a cross-section of American businesses collected here, are getting back to work. 
And I think this cross-section is extraordinarily representative of what we're seeing all around America. And as Larry mentioned, as you know, and as you require us, we watch every little detail of the economy every day. And there are now 27 states, 27 states where more than 75% of the businesses are open. That was almost none a few weeks right. ago. That's and right. there are 28 states where 80% of the workforce is back to work. And so uh, the question then becomes, and it's the last thing I'll say, uh, that the people in this room are saying, yes, but will we have demand for our product? And what we learned today in the personal income report that Larry said is because you required historic policy action, we got money to people who needed it while they were laid off because of big unemployment insurance checks and because of the $1,200 checks that we mailed people. They have the income now that the economies are starting again to go out and demand product. And so we're very, very bullish on what's going on with the restart, sir. Thank you very much, Kevin. Appreciate it. Mr. President, thank you uh, on behalf of 7,000 small business owners. Uh, Wyndham Hotels and Resorts is the world's largest franchisor, great state of New Jersey. Um, and we have, if I could have the first slide up, um, remarkably remained open uh, throughout this crisis, much like uh, Dave and, and, and Duncan. Uh, our hotels here in the United States uh, really never closed. Uh, we, were, we were serving frontline workers. We were serving the National Guard emergency workers. Uh, and, and a large part of that had to do, if I could have the next slide, to the support that, and we really have to, the industry has to call out Secretary Mnuchin, and he, you've been there for us all along. You've listened to us. Um, the PPP Act has been monumental. 95% of our franchisees have applied for either a PPP or an EIDL loan. And uh, we estimate from the surveys that we're hearing back that 80% of them have received one of those, and, and, they, and they view it as, as an absolute lifeline. So what is Dave said is, is most important, this is gonna be a long recovery, even though we've remained open. The most important thing for our franchisees is, 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 is seeing this, this amendment to the 75-25 rule, which, which is in the bill. Seeing the expansion of that loan, loan term from two years to five years, I mean, that's, that's critical for our small business owners. And extending, as the Secretary and I were talking earlier, our ability to, to rehire those employees that we have had to furlough, uh, to be able to bring them back, um, not have it expire on June 30, but have that continue till the end of the year is, is critical for us. Um, we also think um, the idea of a temporary travel tax to spur leisure travel is important, and we know the administration is in, in favor of that. And, and bringing back the full deductibility of, of necessary business expenses to spur business travel would be very, very helpful to opening, opening our, our, our country up again. Because as, as Oscar said, as, as uh, Gary said, just as planes are safe, hotels are safe, they're, they're safe because we've been safe throughout this crisis with, with again, 90% of our hotels operating at, at low occupancy. Demand is coming back, but we need we need those consumers to feel safe, and um, we just thank you for everything that you and the Secretary and, and Congress is doing on, on this industry's behalf, because it, it's going to be a, a tough road back. Well, it's going away, but I think we'll have vaccines, and I think we're going to have uh, therapeutics, and maybe even beyond that, maybe a cure, and it won't be in the long distance. So I, I really think that's going to be helpful. And regardless, it's going away, but that would certainly speed up the process. So. We appreciate it, Jeff. Thank you very much. Gene? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you for bringing together so many great companies, different companies, different sectors of the economy that have, some of them been affected really very different ways uh, during the pandemic. Some able to stay open, some really uh, having great difficulty doing it. But uh, one thing we've heard today, and we had conversations earlier before the meeting got underway, I think all of them are very, very focused on safety, safety of their customers, safety of their employees. I don't think there's been a time when American businesses have been as focused on safety as, as they are right now. And that's a, a great thing for bringing customers back, bringing workers back. Uh, it's, it's been a focus of ours at the Labor Department actually since January. We've uh, tried to help American workers through this crisis. And, so many different ways, but as early as January, we were uh, helping uh, providing uh, guidance, guidelines to 
businesses. We've now put out guidelines to 16 different specific industries on how they can reopen safely. Uh, we'll continue to do that so that uh, companies understand uh, what's expected of them, can have confidence in what they need to do, and, and, and same for workers. And, uh, and we're mindful that, that not every company is going to focus the right way on these things, so we'll continue to respond to employee concerns, complaints as they come in. Um, as Larry and Kevin said, Mr. President, we, we, we've turned a corner. Uh, we put out uh, unemployment numbers yesterday showing that for the first time since February, the number of people on unemployment dropped. And, and that's, that's great. The, the number of filing is still a, much higher than we want. That's a good sign. That's a good sign, isn't it? We, we've, we've turned the corner, Mr. President, and, and we'll get back there to that extraordinary economy that you built uh, so recently, and, and, and we're going to do it safely. Thank you, Gene, very much. A man who's done a very good job, Microsoft. That's a good job they've done, Deborah, right? Thank you very much. Well, well thank you, Mr. President. And yeah, I just think this is a fascinating conversation because it really shows how each industry is unique. Yeah. And as an economy, we need to meet the needs of every industry and put the economy together. Um, you know, not surprisingly, when you're in a business and you're in a sector that creates the tools that people can use to work from home, it's not difficult to have your own employees work from home. And that's what we've been doing. But I think our mission in this first phase has really been much broader than that. It's been twofold. One is to provide the data resources and the technology to support the public health needs of the country, from public health agencies to hospitals to the researchers, as you mentioned, who are on the quest for a vaccine and therapeutics and the like. Uh, and I think more broadly, it has been to work with, frankly, many of these companies around this table to sustain the economy these past few months so that employees could work from home, so students could study from home, so that the government could operate from home when that was needed. Now, it's all about phase two. And I think you put it well, it's all about both protecting public health and reopening the economy. And here we see in some ways something that may look more like a dial than a switch as we go through a series of phases. We think we'll likely continue to see different industries with different needs. We do see technology playing some new and important roles. And on this slide, which you'd have to stand within three feet of to read, um, you'll see the nine different areas where we see different public health needs. But there's three I want to call out because I think they're especially important for the private sector. Uh, the first is the ability to use technology to work with people to detect the disease. Um, I thought the reference to a health declaration was a really good one. Um, it makes sense that at an airport, many employers are going to want that on some kind of self-attestation basis for their employees. It doesn't make sense to do it on a piece of paper. Right. We were developing an app for our employees. We realized, well, everybody's employees need this, so we're now partnering with United Health Group so it can be made available to everybody. The second layer that I think is really important for the private sector is the, is the tracing capability. And you know, we're seeing both companies like Microsoft and others work to create tracing technology that can be used by individuals, that can be deployed by employers, or by health, public health agencies. And then the last is notification, exposure notification, that can be done by individuals with public health officers. I think the key to all of this is captured in the next slide. We want people to be comfortable using this technology. We need to protect people's privacy so that they know that they're not putting their personal information at risk when they use technology in this new way. So we're very committed to doing that. In closing, I would say when you step back from this, this is also the right time to close the broadband gap, which you're addressing through right. stimulus efforts, yeah. and I think there are more. It's the right time to invest in more skilling because we are going to see more jobs demand more digital skills than we did six months ago. And it's the right time to maintain the focus, as you have set, on testing. You noted the progress. We've noticed the progress. We appreciate the progress. But I think even more than the progress is, frankly, the high ambition level the administration has set to sustain that progress. Because I think by fall, if we want students to return to college campuses, if we want more employees to feel safe in the workplace, we're going to see more private sector institutions wanting the ability to test people even when they're asymptomatic. And so that progress, I think, will be another one of the fundamental ingredients that we'll need. So thank you. 
Well, thank you very much. And your first picture was so beautiful. The picture of the White House, I don't think I've ever seen one more beautiful <laughs> than that. I don't know. You must have something very special over at Microsoft. But wasn't that beautiful? Uh, we appreciate it. Thank you very thank much, Brad. Uh, thank you very much. you have any questions, please? Mr. President. Any for the uh, great executives? Mr. President? Yeah. Um, it's obviously been a long day for a lot of Americans, but I'd like to give you an opportunity to address some of your tweets from this morning. Uh, you tweeted, when the looting starts, the shooting starts. How would you know that phrase and not know its racially charged history? Well, I've heard that phrase for a long time. I don't know where it came from, where it originated. I view that in phrase as- In 1967, the Miami police- Well, I don't know. I've also it. heard from many other places, but I've heard it for a long time, as most people have. And frankly, it means when there's looting, people get shot and they die. And if you look at what happened last night and the night before, you see that. It's very common. And that's the way that was meant, and that's the way I think it was supposed to be meant. But I don't know where it came from. I don't know where it originated. I wouldn't know a thing like that. But I will say it's very accurate in the sense that when you do have looting, like you had last night, people often get shot and they die. And that's not good, and we don't want that to happen. Yeah, please. Thank you, Mr. President. In the past, you've criticized NFL players for their prote protest against police brutality, given what we've seen with George Floyd and what we saw with the delays in, in the case of Ahmaud Arbery. Does that change your views around those NFL protests? And also, given that you had a message for those in the streets in Minneapolis, do you have a statement to make about the police that are involved in such police brutality incidents? Yeah, I didn't like what I saw at all. I thought it was a terrible thing, a terrible picture. I think that it's, uh, it's sad in so many ways from the standpoint of the family. Uh, when you look at George Floyd and his family and you see uh, what that's done to them, uh, just just a terrible thing. It's, uh, he was in tremendous pain, obviously, and uh, couldn't breathe. It was very obvious to anybody that watched it. It was a very, very sad thing for me to see that. Uh, we also know that uh, most policemen, you see the great job they do. They do a fantastic job, but this was a terrible insult to police and to policemen. And uh, I know the uh, Justice Department will, as you know, it's a local local case, but I know the Justice Department is also looking at it very strongly. Does that change your views around, like, the NFL protests? Say it again, I can. Does that change your views around the NFL protest on this issue? They were peaceful protests. Does that change your, your, your yeah, stance on that at all? Yeah, it should be a peaceful protest. I think you're really, uh, the, in, in memory of uh, George Floyd, I think it should be peaceful. It's, uh, it's terrible. Uh, he, I spoke with his family today. Terrific people. Uh, I, I think it's so bad for the memory when you see a thing like that going on. And hopefully that won't happen tonight. And as you know, the National Guard has arrived, and they're there. But hopefully everything will be uh, very different tonight. Last night was very sad on many different levels. Uh, yeah, please. Yeah, please. Referencing the Rose Garden, we see tensions with China over the virus now over Hong Kong. Are we witnessing the start of a Cold War between the United States and China? Well, we're certainly not happy with what happened with respect to China. They have a, uh, a virus that started, and when it got out of control, perhaps, I assume that's what happened, it got out of control, whichever way, and they stopped it from going to China, but they didn't stop it from going to the rest of the world. So nobody likes that. That was not good. They did not do a good job. So I don't know if it was incompetence or it was done for some other reason. But I know that I didn't see anything in Beijing and I didn't see anything in other Chinese cities, but I did see them in New York, in London, in Paris. We saw them in Spain and we saw them in Italy. We saw the, the enemy, the invisible enemy come out. And all over the world, 186 countries, and probably more than that now. And uh, they stopped it in China, but they didn't stop it going to Europe and the United States and the rest of the world. So uh, what's that all about? And we have to do a very strong study and figure that out. If I could follow up, are you going to eliminate the special status for Hong Kong? I know you announced the measure law. Well, we're talking about doing a lot of things, and uh, we're not uh, — we're very, very saddened by what happened to our relationship with China. They should have never allowed this to happen. They could have stopped it at the source. We asked them to come in and help them, and they didn't want help from anybody, even the World Health Organization. They wanted to go in, and they were delayed. But we asked to go in very specifically, 
and they didn't want any help. They didn't need any help, and then it got out of control in some form. But it didn't seem to get out of control when it came to going to other parts of China, because it didn't go very far. But it did come to the United States. It did come to Europe. It went all over the world. Mr. President? Yeah. Mr. President. Was your conversation with the Floyd family after the Rose Garden event, what was the, the thing you were trying to impress upon them, and did they have a message for you? Well, I just expressed my sorrow. Uh, that was a horrible thing to witness. And I, I've seen bad things. I've seen many bad things. And that was just a, uh, just a horrible thing to witness and to watch. And it would certainly look like there was no excuse for it. Mr. President, right. Mr. President. Mr. President. For you at all, did they communicate? Uh, they were grieving very much. Look, it was their brother. And uh, they were grieving. And I could see very much that they loved their brother. Okay. Mr. President, yeah, in the back, please. Go ahead, please. Thank you so much, Mr. President. The United States and Brazil right now have more cases than of COVID-19 than any other country. Can you understand me? I want Brazil. You said yes. I, my question is: there are many comparisons between the way you and the Brazilian president handled the pandemic. Do you think it's a fair comparison? And how long do you think the travel ban will be in place? Well, the Brazilian president is a friend of mine, and he's working very hard, and they do have a big, big outbreak. And I can tell you, he's a, he's a very good man, and he loves his country incredibly well. They've had a hard time. There's no question about it. They went a different route than we did. He is against — We did a shutdown. They decided to do it a different way. They're having a very hard time. He is against social distancing at the moment where the Brazil is — take that just for a second? Sure. Right? Yes. The, he is against so, social distancing and lockdown at the moment where the numbers in Brazil are skyrocketing. What do you think about that? Well, he went a different way. Brazil went a different way, and uh, certainly they're having a hard time. I don't want to be critical of anybody because I have great respect for him. And he's doing a very good job with the country that he got hit. He got hit like everybody else. They went about it differently than us. I closed down from China. I closed down from Europe. And we did a lot of close downs. We had a close down from Brazil. You're asking about Brazil. We closed down, as you know, the other night from Brazil. But uh, he's uh, it's a tough time they're having in Brazil. It's a great country, great place, great people, but they're having a very tough time. How long do you think the ban will be in place for Brazil? And are you I also thinking can, Russia and, yeah, and I'd India? I'd like to take the ban off as soon as we can. Okay? Yeah. As soon as we can. Yes, please. Yeah. Mr. President, do you believe that there is a problem with police brutality in America? And if you do, what, what would you do about it? Well, I think that police brutality certainly is something that we've been hearing about, reading about, studying. I have for many years. Uh, and we all have to say, and I think most people would admit, that most of the police men and women that I've seen have been outstanding. When you have something like this happen, you really — you look at it and you just say, how does a thing like that happen? Because it just seems so bad to watch. But. Uh, our police have been very outstanding. Our crime rates are way down right now in this country, and uh, way down. The police have done a great job. Something like this happens, and you really say, that's so, that's so bad in so many different ways and, and so unfortunate. You see the, yeah, please, the go ahead. Yes. Uh, Mr. President, it certainly seems like you're sympathetic to some of the frustration um, expressed by the protesters last night. I want to ask you, first off, do you think there were good people out protesting in Minneapolis last night? Um, Did you and also, say, were they, you say it, were, were there, were good, there people? good people among the protesters? And then also more broadly, what is your message to black Americans and others who just are really frustrated and saddened to see another video of a black man being killed in police custody? Well, certainly there were a lot of different people, and they were good people, too. And they were protesting, and they were protesting for the right reason. They were protesting in honor of a man, George Floyd, where something happened that shouldn't have happened, in my opinion, from what I've seen. Uh, certainly something happened that shouldn't have happened. And, uh, yeah, you had a lot of people out there that were protesting out of sorrow, and then you had people that got out of control, some people. And uh, they did a very — I think they did a great disservice to their state and to their city and to — to really our country, what they did last night. And we brought in the National Guard today, and they're there. And that won't happen again. It can't happen again. We can never let that happen again. That was run by the mayor of a city, and uh, it got, in all fairness to him, it, he was in a tough position. But I don't think they were very well prepared. 
but we brought in the National Guard. They'll be very prepared tonight. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Please. Thank you.